Hi, welcome to Exploring Sunday Scriptures for this week, which will be the first Sunday of May, a communion Sunday. So if you will be attending virtually at home, you want to have some juice and some bread or a cracker in your body to participate in communion. Also exciting Sunday is we have a baptism here in the church. Uh, so this is a sibling that um, was baptized here a few years ago now at the first service um, that will be part of the service as well. So interesting in trying to navigate what does a baptism look like amid COVID-19 and, and uh, face coverings and things of that nature. But we're going to do our best as it's still something to celebrate and a milestone in the beginning of a faith life, a uh, faith journey with a young person and their family. So contextually, that's a couple of things happening. Also, just to bring to light where we are in the season, this is the season of Easter and Ascension Sunday is approaching following Ascension Sunday is Pentecost. So we essentially are coming to the end or the conclusion of the season of Easter, or it's rapidly coming to its close. As we get deep into the season of Easter, we kind of leave behind the actual resurrection appearance stories, and, and our gospel reading ends up going back into the life of Jesus. Some of these are prefiguring resurrection, um, some of these even scholars contend might be, you know, post-resurrection narratives. Some of them are reminders about what the, the key facets of the church is to be about. So the reason that we hear them in the season of Easter is as Pentecost comes, the beginning of the actual church, the birthday of the church, these lessons imparted become the cornerstone that the church, that the apostles, uh, the foundations of the church itself are built upon, so the forgiveness of sins and loving one another and things of that nature. So if you're hearing themes like that over these past couple of weeks, you're hearing right. We are hearing what it is uh, that really the church was charged to be about. Even last week uh, from Acts of the Apostles, by what authority are you doing this? By the authority or by the name of Jesus Christ. So not by anything we have done, but by virtue of what God has done in Christ is what uh, provides the power to the things that happen in the early church. We continue through the season, as I've said in the past, with the Old Testament being replaced with Acts of the Apostles. So the story of the early church, as will continue to be the case through to Pentecost. Other contextual things, as always, I encourage you to reflect on those things that are specific to your life. So what is happening uh, with you, around you, that will influence how you are experiencing God's Word for any specific day or for this coming Sunday. We certainly have uh, improving weather, springtime happening um, is always a positive influence, I think, on people's disposition. That being said, we still very much live within this pandemic reality uh, and cases flaring up here and there, uh, profoundly impacting India, for example, the border to Canada still being closed. Limitations on all of our lives that we still live with and uh, many have, have grown tired of are doing well and honoring them, but it, it certainly is wearing thin on all of us. And there could be other very specific things in your life depending on uh, your life journey. So where you are as a parent or a grandparent or a friend, uh, what's happening with those around you. You might take a little bit and just reflect on some of the contexts that will play upon how you hear scripture before launching into the reading of this scripture. Now, I'm going to be honest, as with last week, this is my first exposure, not my very first exposure. I've preached on these passages before in the past as part of the lectionary, uh, and I did compose the bulletin for this Sunday. But this is my first ex exposure to these scriptures at this direct moment, as I begin my investigations into those scriptures. So, um, as I reflect with you now, it really is sort of my first impressions as well. And this is often where I start my sermon research, is by reading the scripture, often in multiple different translations, as a way to see what, what is impacting me first. How is it reaching me? Uh, what is it saying to me? What are the things... What are the words, what are the individuals that, that first really just seem to um, shine for me as I read through them? And then from that, that often is the thread that begins 
my thought process on the focus of, of the sermon or where I feel the Holy Spirit is guiding me and leading me to, uh, to go and to explore. And so then I start to plumb into um, reflections from scholars and others, sometimes going into the biblical Greek to see how different words or what specific words are, how else they are used in the New Testament and outside of the New Testament. But this is the first part of that process. As I have with past weeks, I'm going to read it in two forms. And if you attended this past Sunday, virtually or in person, you may have noted that I used the message translation. It was not the New Revised Standard Version. And I did that on purpose. There are times Times where in reading the scripture, I think that it's beneficial to perhaps have a different translation than the one that I most dominantly use, which is uh, the New Revised Standard Version. So I, I'm going to read both of those uh, one after another before I offer a few reflections on each of the passages. As always, I try to keep our time to about 30 minutes. So we're going to begin with Acts. This is a little deeper in the book of Acts of the Apostles. And just a quick note about Acts of the Apostles. The Gospel of Luke and Acts of the Apostles are essentially chapter 1 and chapter 2. They are two parts of one whole. The Gospel of John gets inserted between them, unfortunately. It would be much better if in the layout of the New Testament they were right next to each other, as then we would read them as two parts to a greater whole. Um, so this is the same author as, as Luke, and um, it is as the first part of the story, if you read the very first verses of Luke, is the intent to write down an accurate account of the life of Jesus. So Acts of the Apostles is the intent to write out an accurate account of the beginning of the church. So both have a different rationale for their writing, uh, but they are two parts of a whole. And um, if you find yourself looking for a, a discipline of sorts, a, a reading discipline of the New Testament, you might consider reading Luke and Acts as two parts of a whole in sequence to one another. So we're in the eighth chapter, um, and it's an interesting episode here, the um, conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. Then an angel of the Lord said to Philip, get up and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a wilderness road. So he got up and went. Now there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of the Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning home, seated in his chariot. He was reading the prophet Isaiah. Then the spirit said to Philip, go over to this chariot and join it. So Philip ran up to it and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. He asked, do you understand what you are reading? He replied, how can I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to get in and sit beside him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. Like a sheep he was led to the slaughter, and like a lamb silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who can describe his generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, about whom, may I ask, does the prophet say this? About himself or about someone else? And then Philip began to speak, and starting with this scripture, he proclaimed to him the good news about Jesus. As they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What is to prevent me from being baptized? He commanded the chariot to stop, and both of them, Philip and the eunuch, went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. The eunuch saw him no more and went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he was passing through the region, he proclaimed the good news to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. All right, now here is the other translation, the message translation. Later, God's angel spoke to Philip. At noon today, I want you to walk over to that desolate road that goes from Jerusalem down to Gaza. He got up and went. He met an Ethiopian eunuch coming down the road. 
The eunuch had been on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem and was returning to Ethiopia, where he was minister in charge of all of the finances of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. He was riding in a chariot and reading the prophet Isaiah. The spirit told Philip, climb into the chariot. Running up alongside, Philip heard the eunuch reading Isaiah and asked, do you understand what you're reading? He answered, how can I without some help? And invited Philip into the chariot with him. The passage he was reading was this, as a sheep led to slaughter and quiet as a lamb being sheared, he was silent, saying nothing. He was mocked and put down, never got a fair trial, but who now can count his kin since he's been taken from the earth? The eunuch said, tell me, who is the prophet talking about himself or some other? Philip grabbed his chance. Using this passage as his text, he preached Jesus to him. As they continued down the road, they came to a stream of water. The eunuch said, here's water. Why can't I be baptized? He ordered the chariot to stop. They both went down to the water, and Philip baptized him on the spot. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of God suddenly took Philip off, and that was the last the eunuch saw of him. But he didn't mind. He had what he'd come for and went on down the road as happy as he could be. Philip showed up in Azotus and continued north, preaching the message in all the villages along that route until he arrived at Caesarea. All right. So some interesting things here. Number one, we have a baptism this week. So when we have a passage that also focuses on baptism, it offers an opportunity to speak about baptism and to lean into this episode of conversion that we have in the eunuch. The, some of the things at play is though the eunuch had gone up to Jerusalem in pilgrimage because he was a eunuch. And so some of the physical alterations that um, he had gone through it made him so he could not be fully a part of the community of faith as a result. So when we see him um, being baptized, it's an inclusion then into the community of Christ, something that was denied him. The other thing that we pick up on is he's reading from Isaiah, uh, but says, you know, when nobody tells me, teaches me about it, how can I possibly understand it? So this shines a light on the denial that the eunuch had faced in really seeking to learn or grow in his faith um, and in his knowledge about God. And Philip being one then that uh, provides an opening for God's grace to to work in the eunuch's life. Um, it certainly represents an extension of the ministry of teaching that we see in Jesus. So here is another example of the early church and what it is that the church's function is to be about, which is to open our minds to Scripture, to understand all the things written and prophesied about concerning Jesus uh, of Nazareth. So that's exactly what Philip does. It's exactly what comes to be in the church. It's exactly what um, our worship mimics. So if you really look at this in the context of can we understand this as worship, there's an opening or a greeting, there is a reading of scripture, there is an explanation of, of the scripture and a proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, there is a response then, we might call that an offering, but one response uh, or other responses include sacramental responses, baptism and communion are responses to God's grace in Christ. So this becomes a, a form, if you will, for what our worship ends up looking like in this episode. Now, Christian worship is really based off uh, rabbinical Jewish worship as well, so it is not something that comes uniquely from this episode, but certainly we can see within it the, the unfolding of worship as we come to know it. Um, we have somebody from Ethiopia, from a faraway place, so it certainly represents the expanding of the gospel beyond the boundaries that we may we may uh, set, which is something we see in Acts of the Apostles continually. Every time even Peter thinks that he understands where the limits are of, of uh, sharing the good news, God continues to expand that and expand that and expand that. And we had last week, until all come into one flock or all belong to, to this flock together. Um, there's nothing that prevents him from being baptized, not, not his 
not those alterations related to his being a eunuch or otherwise, simply his faith. That is the only thing that is required for baptism. Um, so we see that the, the church doesn't impose limits um, physically or otherwise on those who seek to open themselves to God's grace and, and to conversion, to, to uh, faith in Jesus Christ. Um, interesting that we have Philip just disappearing. It's probably something that I wouldn't concentrate on in preaching, but after he's been baptized, Philip just kind of seems to evaporate is what is implied here. Um, what that means, hard to say. Maybe it's just uh, again, if we put it in the context of worship, the benediction has happened and the eunuch goes off into his life as Philip goes off into the mission field in his own direction. So not really a sense that suddenly he disappeared from the scene, but that was the conclusion of that time that they had together. So lots there in this first passage. Um, Isaiah is often used as the the, the prophet that is leaned most heavily upon in the sense of, of pointing toward Jesus and who the person of Jesus was. So it's not a surprise to see that as the prophet mentioned here. Um, but let's switch over to the epistle reading, which is from um, John's first letter. So 1 John, this is in chapter 4, and we've really been reading through John sequentially, and we continue to do that this week. Uh, last week we were in the third chapter, so now we're in the fourth chapter. It's a little bit longer reading. I'm still going to read it in both forms, so uh, bear with me in this, and then I'll speak to it a little bit. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us of his spirit and we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this way, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. The perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Now, here is the message translation. My beloved friends, let us continue to love each other since love comes from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and experiences a relationship with God. The person who refuses to love doesn't know the first thing about God because God is love. So you can't know him if you don't love. This is how God showed his love for us. God sent his only son into the world so we might live through him. This is the kind of love we are talking about. Not that we once upon a time loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to clear away our sins and the damage they've done to our relationship with God. My dear, dear friends, if God loved us like this, we certainly ought to love each other. No one has seen God, ever. But if we love one another, God dwells deeply within us, and his love becomes complete in us, perfect love. This is how we know we're living steadily and deeply in him and he in us. He's given us life from his life, from his very own spirit. Also, we've seen for ourselves and continue to state openly that the Father sent his Son as Savior of the world. Everyone who confesses that Jesus is God's Son participates continuously in an intimate relationship with God. 
We know it so well. We've embraced it heart and soul, this love that comes from God. God is love. When we take up permanent residence in a life of love, we live in God and God lives in us. This way, love has the run of the house because at home and because at home and mature in us so that we're free of worry on judgment day, our standing in the world is identical with Christ's. There's no room in love for fear. Well-formed love banishes fear. Since fear is crippling, a fearful life, fear of death, fear of judgment, is one not yet fully formed in love. We, though, are going to love, love and be loved. First we were loved, now we love. He loved us first. If anyone boasts, I love God, and goes right on hating his brother or sister, thinking nothing of it, he is a liar. If he won't love the person he can see, how can he love the God he can't see? The command we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. This is one of those passages that in some ways I feel like doesn't really need explanation. It just... um like many of John's things, it's this, this circular pattern that repeats um, and is driving home the reality, well, God's reality, and God's reality being best represented by the word love, and it, and it keeps pushing at this. Uh, and what we have here is the way that we know God's love is by virtue of Jesus. That is how we know God's love. Uh, which the one translation in the New Revised Standard, I think, did this better. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. So we have there that God is the source of love and that Christ is the way that we understand and experience that love. And it's by virtue of that experience that we then can do no less than love one another, which was also Christ's new commandment given in the Gospel of John. I give you this new commandment that you love one another as I have loved you, so you love one another. It's when we love, when we love, that God comes to dwell in us. And the other thing that I think I really picked up on in reading this passage is love is a relational reality. Um, while certainly there is a, a need to love oneself, there is a sense in this that the way in which we experience the love of God comes through our love for one another and the love exchanged between each other. Um, and that's how the love becomes perfected in us. Um, so uh, I'm trying to find the place here. There is a place where I thought it really highlighted that. It's abiding in the love. There was there was another place. So this is the message translation of it around the 11th verse, and maybe I'll go back and look at the other. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also to, ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is perfected in us. The other translation was, My dear, dear friends, if God loved us like this, we certainly ought to love each other. No one has seen God ever. But if we love one another, God dwells deeply within us and his love becomes completely in us perfect love. So this is the sense that I have that it is relational and um, in community that we experience this is we don't ever see God, but in... Uh, our love for one another, in, in that experience of love that we share with one another, that is where God shows up. And for me, this is always that, that affirmation that where two or three are gathered, there I am, that Jesus said, is, is that affirmation, that um, connection in each other's lives, commitment to each other, love for one another, is an essential aspect of God being part of it. Um, there was another thing, too, that I... Do. 
I can't remember where it is. And I see that I'm running a little short on time. I want to keep this to half an hour. So let me shift over to the gospel. But that is just one of those passages that I think preaches for itself. This is from John 15. So this is part of Jesus's last teachings and words um, to the disciples. Eight verses here. Uh, I'll read both translations, give you a little, a little snapshot into it. And then that will conclude our time together. And I'm hoping to resume in-person options in May. So stay tuned. I will still have these online as well to share with you. So John 15. I am the true vine and my father is the vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You have already been cleansed by the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit, because apart from me you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask for whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Here's the other translation. I'm the real vine and my Father is the farmer. He cuts off every branch of me that doesn't bear grapes. And every branch that is grape bearing, he prunes back so it will bear even more. You are already pruned back by the message I have spoken. Live in me. Make your home in me, just as I do in you. In the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine, you can't bear fruit unless you are joined with me. I am the vine. You're the branches. When you're joined with me and I with you, the relation, intimate and organic, the harvest is sure to be abundant. Separated, you can't produce a thing. Anyone who separates from me is dead wood gathered up and thrown on the bonfire. But if you make yourselves at home with me and my words are at home in you, you can be sure that whatever you ask will be listened to and acted upon. This is how my Father shows who he is when you produce grapes, when you mature as my disciples. I think in some ways this um, reiterates the sense of relationship. In this case, it's a relationship with Jesus uh, in this, I and me and you in uh, I in you and you and me, um, and that sense that that is how we end up being productive, how we end up sharing the the fruit of the spirit. So we could go back to the epistle reading and say that that is love. The word love is best the best representation of that. Now this are Jesus's words to the disciples, and so we have early on. You are already pruned back by the message I have spoken. So he he is already saying you're ready to be productive for the work that lies ahead. Um, so in sharing this image, he is trying to help them to now realize what they're being charged to do and how it is that they can remain productive, which is connection with Jesus. Well, what is that connection? That connection is the life and ministry and teachings that Jesus has imparted to them. Now, right before this is his, his sort of um, you know, final teaching, his last lecture, in which he says, I give you now the new commandment, after washing their feet, says, I give you now the new commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. By this, everyone will know that you are mine and that you belong to me. Now we have, I am the vine, you are the branches. And so it's a sense that um, what flows here is that love and that the, pro, pro, the fruit is the effect, the impact of that love. Um, I appreciate it in the second translation. It said, when you're joined with me and I with you, the relation intimate and organic. The relation between God, between Christ and us is, is um, intimate and organic. Um, then, then it bears much fruit. Then the harvest is sure to be abundant. So as we are intimately in relation with God, so we end up intimately in relation with one another. We love one another. We love God. 
we love one another. There we have the commandment, right? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. In that uh, intimate and organic relation, the harvest is abundant. So the effects are going to be abundant. This again is a scripture to help us as we're looking towards ascension and Pentecost of what is the mission of the church? What are we being charged to do? We're, we're, we're being charged, if you will, with productivity, with making sure that we are we are connected to the vine, that we have cut away anything which does not encourage our our sharing, our our harvest, our productivity, um, so our fruitfulness. So the sharing of our love, we've cut that away, whatever that might be. Um, and so we can be in intimately related and organically connected to Christ by our intimate and organic connections to one another, because that is how we experience the presence of the living Christ with us, is in our relationships to each other. Again, where two or three are gathered, there I am. So we've reached that 30-minute mark. That's usually my threshold for, for asking you to bear with me as we explore Sunday scriptures. I pray that this has been illuminating for you and hopefully has given you a small uh, entry into our scriptures for this week. So until next time, I encourage you to read through these scriptures again a few times before Sunday to keep exploring them and to ponder how it is that they are reaching you on this given week. All right, God bless you, and we'll see you soon.